everybody, welcome to ARE Live. I'm Mark Tier, the founder of Black Spectacles, and today, again, I'm with uh, Mike Newman, and we're gonna be discussing another ARE 5 exam, a project development and documentation exam. So this exam is one of the two exams you might take if you're doing the ARE 4 to ARE 5 transition, or what we've started calling the five exam plan, um, where you can take three exams in ARE 4 and then finish up with two exams in ARE 5. So this is one of those two uh, ARE 5 exams that you'd need to take. Uh, so this is a very timely session. Uh, I assume all of you guys know that ARE 5 launches on November 1st. Um, so the clock is ticking. We're actually heads down here at Black Spectacles uh, building our brand new ARE 5 curriculum, which it's hard to believe uh, <laughs> will launch on Friday, October 1st. So about a day and a half it's gonna launch. So be sure to check back you know, with us on Friday to see the curriculum. Um, we're also launching some new tools for the ARE 4.0 um, and made some changes to our design software um, subscriptions. So there's a ton to see. Make sure you come back and, and check it out. Uh, before we get started, I want to mention our next ARE Live. So we're going to do an in-person ARE Live next <coughs> month on uh, October 20th. And we're going to do it here at, at Black Spectacles offices at 1871 in the Merchandise Mart here in Chicago. Um, we'll again be collaborating with our friend Mike Newman here, um, as well as our friends uh, at AIA Chicago's Young Architects Forum. And we'll be featuring three young architects, um, each of whom will have committed to sort of taking a different path to pass the ARE. One's going to be taking only the ARE. Uh, we'll find out why. The other's only taking ARE 5.0. We'll find out why. And the other is doing this five, five exam uh, plan uh, where you take those only the five exams. So it'll be a good way um, to sort of discuss the benefits of the different uh, strategies. So you can decide what is best for you. Um, uh, as I say, it's a live in-person event here. So we're gonna have free drinks. So there'll be beer, um, there'll be food. Uh, space is limited. So if you wanna register to attend for free, of course, um, you can see the, uh, the URL on the, on the screen here, but for those of you who are listening, it's bksp.es slash ARE live dash RSVP. So again, that's bksp.es slash ARE live dash RSVP. Um, does the beer actually help in passing the ARE? Yeah, actually, I've, I've heard You've that. You've heard, um, it is one of, the, in, one of the anecdotes we've heard. Yeah, it actually improves uh, pass, <laughs> pass rates. Um, we'll be doing a, a, a PDF uh, report on that later this year. Um, anyways, we'll be giving away free teas. Um, should be a lot of fun, a uh, great way to meet a lot of new people um, if you're new to this whole thing and trying to make a decision about what to do. So, um, And for those of you who are tuned in, and of course, you know, if you're not in Chicago, um, you know, buy a plane ticket, get here. <laughs> um, but if that's out of the, out of the question, um, we'll be broadcasting live as usual. Um, and you can register at blackspectacles.com slash podcast. As I said, I'm here with Mr. Newman. Uh, if you don't know Mike, he's an adjunct professor at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. He's also the founder of Shed Studio and he's the instructor for Black Spectacles online ARE exam prep curriculum. Uh, if you haven't already checked out the ARE exam prep curriculum that I was just talking about, you can go to blackspectacles.com to watch any of the free videos um, from any of the courses. Today we have a special Black Spectacles promo code to share. Um, and at the end of today's episode, um, we'll choose someone from all the folks who submitted their answers to the mock exam and they'll win a free one month ARE prep Black Spectacles subscription. I guess you'll get to pick if you want to do the ARE 4 or ARE 5. Um, and we'll be tracking your answers. Everyone who gets them all right will get a free Black Spectacles t-shirt. So stay tuned for that too. And lastly, tonight we'll be taking questions using the GoToWebinar question box, as well as on Twitter using the ARE Live podcast hashtag. So that's ARE Live podcast. That's the hashtag. So with that, I'll hand it over to you, Mr. Newman. Okay. Uh, so as Mark says, uh, we're getting very close to this uh, big transition. Uh, I won't spend a lot of time on it because we've already talked about it in a lot of other situations and my guess is that everybody is pretty familiar, but just to kind of put it into context, uh, remember that the ARE4, the existing system for exam, is based on the idea of uh, individual silos of information. So there's a structures exam, there's a systems exam, there's a contracts exam, there's a site planning exam, etc. cetera. Uh, and uh, that concept is sort of, uh, it's not really a great way to really think about how architecture actually works out in, in the real world. 
Uh, it doesn't really match how, how we, uh, we work out in the field. Uh, and so NCARB decided in their wisdom to make a leap from that kind of silo thinking into the ARE5 construct, which uh, has two exams that are sort of standalone exams. Uh, one is about sort of general practice management, like how you run a firm, you know, insurance and contracts and stuff like that. The other one is about uh, project management, a kind of overall idea of how projects get run. And then the other four are chronological in the sequence of how a project would go. So the first one is about kind of, first of that four is about uh, the idea of uh, programming and that kind of thing. The second one is about uh, kind of a design development uh, sort of level of thinking, kind of schematic design, design development. And the third one is then about kind of uh, construction documents and kind of that permit level of thinking, the uh, kind of really getting into the details and how you communicate that information to uh, contractors, things like that. Uh, uh, and that's the one that we're going to be talking about today. And then the last one uh, is the, the sixth of the six exams is the one uh, that is about what your role as an architect is during the construction of a project. So clearly there's a big difference between four and five. As I said, four is about these individual silos. Five is much more about uh, kind of the flow of how a project really works out in the real world. Uh, in my mind, uh, we've talked about this before, in my mind that's actually a good thing. I think NCARB has been very smart about this as a process. Uh, and I think there's something really interesting about kind of thinking of the, of the exam in that way. It puts uh, more of an onus on kind of really understanding when you would need to know certain pieces of information and you know, where you're really thinking about it, where you're focusing on at any particular moment in the process, which I think is great. The tricky part about it is in the 4.0 version, there's a certain clarity to it that may not make sense in terms of how we work out in the world, but it does kind of make sense in terms of an exam, right? Uh, if I have a structures exam, well, I can just focus on structures for a month and then take all the structural que structure questions. Uh, same with systems, same with contracts. Whereas in this system, this 5.0 system, now we're talking about the idea that, you know, you could have a structures question in the programming phase. There might be something that says, well, you know, here's a bunch of soil information uh, and you're just getting the, the site uh, survey information. And now you have to think, well, what kind of uh, project would make sense? Do we want to, uh, you know, what kind of uh, impact does this soil have in terms of a structural question? The next exam, there might be a question that's more about kind of general planning issues. Is it long span? Is it a short span? What kind of choices would I have in that? And then in the third one, it might be a structural question that's about, all right, we've chosen that we're going to do, say, steel wide flange construction. Uh, how would we size that, ma that material? What might the connections be like? Uh, you know, so in, in other words, you're going to have structural questions on a number of different exams. You're going to have systems questions on a number of different exams. You'll have contract questions on a number of different exams. So I think even though I like the idea of it, I don't know that it's easier for you. So uh, we'll see. Proof will be in the pudding. Like who knows exactly what it'll be like until they actually uh, launch in November. Uh, but uh, it's sort of an interesting moment and I think it's going to be uh, intriguing to see how people feel about uh, using the 5.0. So uh, we're sort of excited by the concept. We're uh, kind of gearing up to, uh, to launch our new 5.0 uh, uh, sort of system for uh, thinking about how these things are going to work. We're uh, very excited by that. But you're at this point where you need to decide, well, am I going to try to do it under four? Am I going to try to you know, keep, keep rolling in four if you've already started or start in four? Uh, or am I going to try to do the transition as Mark was talking about? There's this sort of interesting possibility for doing the whole thing in, in fewer exams if you're very clever about it, the three plus two. Or do you just want to wait until the 5.0 and all the bugs are out and you're going to uh, sort of let it settle down for a little bit and then you're going to blast through everything in, in 5.0. They're all possibilities. There is no right answer. It's really just finding your comfort zone from the information that, uh, that we have. So on that Let's dive in. Um, we're going to be talking about one of the particular new types of uh, questions that will show up on the 5.0 exam that didn't, doesn't exist on the 4.0 exams. 
And that's the case study idea. And the reason that we wanted, to, first of all, is we wanted to give people a chance to see what it looks like. But the other reason that we wanted to uh, kind of start with this uh, as a, a sort of way of thinking about this information is that we think it's kind of representative of the way that NCARB is trying to now uh, reimagine the exam. So for many years now, uh, decades really, uh, the exam has really been focused on um, well, the vignettes, which are sort of the crazy drawing program under 4.0, uh, but also these multiple choice questions that are standalone multiple choice questions. And so you have these very limited uh, sort of moments of here's a question, there's a very limited bunch of amount of information about the topic. You have to sort of divine uh, from, from that limited piece of information what it is they're actually looking for you to answer. Uh, and it's each one is sort of a little haiku in a way, and it's sort of this awkward uh, process because there's so little information uh, to sort of put it into context. And under 5.0, part of their thinking is that's not really architectural, that architectural situations are really where I have a bunch of different pieces of information, and then I have a series of different issues I have to work out. And I may need to go uh, to uh, a site plan to understand one part of the information, but then go to the code to understand another part of the information. And I put those pieces of information together, and now I can answer a question. So this is the case studies. And all of the 5.0 exams will have at least one case study. Some of the bigger exams, like this one, will probably have two, although maybe not right off the bat, because they may take them a while to build up uh, enough uh, questions for it, but each exam will have at least one case study, some will have two, and the way it will work is you'll have a series of your regular multiple choice questions to start the exam, and then you get to a certain point and it like, goes to a new type of page, and it says, all right, you're now at the case study point, uh, and there'll be a series of different tabs from which you can access a bunch of pieces of information. So it might be a tab for some code information or for uh, the zoning code or uh, there might be another tab for a site plan or photos or something like that. You could have a whole series, it might be five tabs or might be eight tabs. Uh, you know, we'll see how they do it, but it'll be many pieces of information. And then there'll be anywhere from about 12 to 25 questions that pertain to any or all of those different pieces of information. So you'll have to decide, do you want to go through and look at all the different tabs and read through you know, much of the information? You're not going to read from the beginning to the end because you know, something like a code, there may be you know, 100 pages of code in there uh, and you wouldn't want to just start reading, it'd take forever. But you'd maybe go through and figure out kind of what's, what they've given to you and what kind of information is there and then go to the questions or you might decide, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to go straight to the questions, figure out what they're really looking for in the question, and then I'm going to go f search it out in the uh, tabs of information. So there's no real right answer. This is one of the things you're going to start kind of getting used to and having your own opinion about how you want to attack the information. So this is a very different idea than just uh, a you know, small standalone type question. Uh, this is now potentially something where you might have to sort of contact a couple of different sources of information uh, and then uh, gather that information together to, in order to answer a question. Or there might be mixed in there ones that you actually don't need to use any of the information that they've given you. You just use your uh, common sense and, and architectural knowledge. So uh, you'll be def deciding as you go along how I'm going to use all of these different tabs of information. All right, I think we got a pretty good idea of what's going on. Let's, uh, let's jump forward. So uh, for those of you that uh, were with us in the last one of these, um, we use this uh, same basic idea. Our concept here is that uh, the scenario in which we're going to be uh, talking about some uh, mock exam questions uh, for this case study is uh, you are in charge of a project, and that project is for a brand new tech company, uh, and that uh, business needs um, uh, this tech company will have administration, financial issues, marketing, uh, it'll have a prototyping uh, area. So it's a tech company, it's a couple floors, 
Uh, the client has some specific ideas about how the work uh, should operate and what it should feel like and how people will need to be able to communicate. Um, but essentially what the experience should be like, uh, uh, what it should feel like for people to work there. And so they've given us that information. Uh, but you know, there's also certain realities. Uh, it has a real site uh, and there are some issues with the site. Uh, and there's some zoning and uh, building code issues. Uh, so there's a series of supporting documents. Um, we're going to take a look at a series of questions and then we'll go through from there. So I'm going to go to the first question. And then from at this point, once we take a look at this first question, we'll take a look at what our uh, supporting documents are. All right, so our first question is, how many women's room WCs, water closets, will be needed for this project? And then a little bit more information there. So that's uh, clearly going to be a kind of code type question. So the first thing we're looking at, the first uh, uh, tab of information we have is the scenario that we just looked at. So that's just telling us kind of the basic information about uh, what's going on. And the name of the company is Jumpster. How's that for ridiculous made up uh, current sounding thing? And then here's a program. So this is conceptually what the uh, clients gave to us in order to uh, work through on the project. So uh, the location is in Springfield. The project is new construction for new office and accessory spaces for tech startup company. Uh, the mission is to provide a new state-of-the-art tech startup with a prototyping facility that brings joy and efficiency to the workers, enhances the neighborhood, and protects the environment. So it's kind of interesting to note that part of their thinking is protecting the environment built right into the mission. Uh, the goals is a high performance building, efficient grouping for the office department. There's a whole series of different uh, pieces of information in there that are sort of useful for us to know. And then when we start getting into a little more data, we have the number of people, the number of employees in each of the different uh, uh, departments, some uh, future growth, some square foot areas that we uh, are sort of as assuming we have a square footage number for the building, and then some conclusions. All right, we'll look at the next thing is an environmental information. Environmental information, uh, we're gonna go to the actual information part. Uh, so this would be a, a phase one, essentially, environmental phase one. And it tells us uh, what they found on the site. Uh, the subject property had an active fuel tank for oil storage for many years. Uh, and the, let's see, typical evidence, uh, previous construction, so a lot of rubble foundations, uh, some minor indications of asbestos and some uh, uh, lead paint. Um, that's about it. So a little bit of issue. The oil tank is a high risk. Everything else is sort of moderate. Uh, some other information uh, as you go along, and then there's an executive summary uh, at the end. There's some climate information. So this is telling us what is this uh, place. Uh, so it's a temperate climate. Uh, you look at the average winters, well, sort of an average typical winter day, a low of 15 degrees, a high of 35. So, you know, this is a, a pretty cold environment, but relatively warm in the summer. So that means there are issues both of uh, being in a cold climate and being in a warm climate. That's what temperate is really telling us. Uh, and it, we're, we're at 40 degrees latitude, in case that's uh, meaningful for you. Uh, and then there's some other pieces of information. There's some uh, proposals about uh, what would be useful uh, for this project uh, about climate issues and uh, what kinds of issues they might want from their uh, design in order to kind of make it into the project for their interests in being. Uh, sort of climate forward, if you will, environmental forward. There's some zoning code information. Uh, so lots of uh, information about setbacks and uh, building heights and things like that. There's a zoning map. So here's our site. It's along something referred to as a pedestrian street. If we actually had read through the zoning code, we would have seen a number of references to the idea of the pedestrian street. That just means it's a, one of the important streets of, the, of that particular city and that they have extra rules about that, uh, that type of street. They, 
it'll have different parking issues, it'll have different uh, frontage issues, whole series of things. Uh, also, interestingly, there's a transit station right nearby. It's a, a, some sort of metro system that uh, is very, very close by. So that potentially has some uh, usefulness. Here's the aerial view. There's our site. There's the transit station. This is the big uh, important street, another big uh, important street where the transit station is on. Gives you a pretty good idea of uh, the scale of the types of buildings that we're talking about. And then uh, the last one here is uh, portions of the International Building Code. Uh, so this has uh, part of Chapter 3, the use and occupancy classification. Chapter 5, the general building heights and areas. Chapter 6, the types of construction. Uh, chapter 10, means of egress. And Chapter 29, plumbing systems. Uh, so that's the range of information we have. Uh, if we start kind of scrolling through, you can see it's just literally uh, the code all by itself. Now, when you actually get into the real exam, the code will actually have some ability to do highlighting. It'll have some ability to uh, uh, bookmark certain pages. Uh, you, you know, there'll be, a, there'll be, it's more than just something you, you can scroll through. For our purposes tonight, we're just going to use a sort of scroll through it kind of a version of things just to keep it simple. Uh, but that gives you an idea of the kinds of information uh, that you might get on one of these case studies. So let's go back to the actual questions and we'll see, uh, see how we feel about it. So the first question, as we said, was how many women's rooms, how many women's room WCs, water closets, toilets, will be needed for this project? Uh, so there's a couple of numbers here. It mentions 50,000 square foot gross, but then it also tells us use 40,000 square feet. Uh, and there's various reasons why we've done that just to kind of keep it simple. Uh, but it's telling us right there that we're going to be thinking of this building as 40,000 square feet. Now you might wonder right off the bat, why do I care if it's 40,000 square feet? Uh, and the reason is because in order to figure this out, we need to determine the occupancy, the number of people that are going to be in this building. Now, we can do that a couple of different ways. One way is we can literally count up the number of people who are going to be in the building. We may have a pretty good idea of that from the program and from some other, other sources. But that doesn't necessarily mean that the code officials will accept those numbers. If we count up uh, and we say, yeah, this is going to be a 40,000 square foot building and we think there's going to be 10 people in it, the code officials probably will say, well, that's ridiculous. That's, that's a much bigger building. Like, they're not, you're not going to have 10 people and that's going to be a lot more people than that. And so you're going to need more bathrooms than what you would need for just 10 people. So how do you normally do it? Well, what you're normally going to do is you're going to track down uh, the uh, area for this particular use type of how much space per person there is uh, for this building. So we're looking for that number of how many people, how many square feet per person in this type of use. So uh, if we kind of do a quick sort of look through, we're going to talk about uh, use and occupancy classifications. So right off the bat, we're going to see business use is group B. So that's what we're looking for. Uh, and then the other thing we want to know is what that per square foot, uh, how many square feet per person number is. So we're going to kind of scan through. Um, before we do that, I'm going to take a quick look back here at the uh, thing. Um, there's a couple of different places where this can show up. Uh, it can actually show up uh, under the chapter three. It can show up uh, in some other spots. I'm actually going to take us to a portion of the means of egress section. So hang on to your hats. I'm going to spin through here pretty uh, fast. Hope nobody gets a seizure. So you can see that this is a lot of uh, potential information. You are not stopping and reading this uh, and going all the way through it. You might kind of stop and sort of understand what all the issues are that uh, are covered in what's here so you know what to be, you can be looking for. Uh, but it's just too much information to go through. So you're going to want to be using the hyperlinks and the, the uh, bookmarks and all of that. 
All right, here we are in the means of egress section. All right, maximum floor area allowances per occupant. So this is one of those spots where, uh, there's, like I say, it shows up in a couple of different places. Uh, this one is typically used for the means of egress, but um, you get the, uh, get the idea. Um, there it is, business areas, 100 square foot per person. So that's a useful number for us to know. So now when we kind of go back here, we can start thinking about, all right, uh, it's 100 square foot per person. We have a 40,000 square foot number for our calculation. Uh, We uh, obviously in, uh, have 100 square foot per person. We have 40,000 square foot uh, building. We divide the 40,000 by the 100. And we have a potential occupancy of 400 persons. Okay, that's a really important number to know. Uh, and now we would go back and we're gonna be looking uh, for the specific number um, yeah, and one thing you may notice is that this is, it gets a little complicated. Sometimes it's gross, sometimes it's net. Um, that's why I specifically said in the question, use 40,000, because I wanted to make sure that you were using that number and not uh, getting complicated, because it's actually a little complicated through that. And they will make it very clear in those cases which, which way you're going to be using that. Um, so now we're going to go uh, all the way towards the end and look at the uh, uh, plumbing numbers. So this is a big, long document, so it'll take me just a second. We won't be doing this all night here. We Once. need to get you some scrolling music. Yeah, we do need some scrolling music. I'll be playing the violin or I something. I guess we'll take requests in the question box. All right. Uh, all right, here we're in Chapter 29, Plumbing Systems. Uh, minimum plumbing facilities, minimum number of required plumbing fixtures. Uh, there we go. All right, so here's our classification. Here's our number of uh, WCs, water closets. So here we are in assemblies. Well, that's interesting, but not useful for us. So we keep scrolling down until we get to something useful. Whoop, there it is, business. So we're in a uh, B business category. Uh, and here it is. This is the section that's talking about uh, the WCs. You can see right up there if I put it there. So in these other ones, they divided the male and the female separately. This one is all together. And what it's telling us is one per 25 for the first 50. So in other words, two for the first 50. And then one per 50 after that. So if we uh, kind of think of that as 400 people, uh, and we say, all right, uh, the, uh, just to make it easy, what I'm going to say is let's divide that by uh, 50 and then add one, because that's essentially the same thing. Uh, so I'm going to say 400 divided by 50 equals 8. And then we have to add that other one that was in the beginning, and we have 9. So our answer is 9. Oh, wait a minute. No, it isn't, and this is the reason I make this big play on this, is because this is a classic NCARB little flip in the situation. Nine is our total number. So nine is the total number of WCs. So we would divide that in half, because it's questions about women. So we need to put the number in just for the half. Well, half of nine is 4.5. So four doesn't work, because it's not enough. Nine isn't right. 18 is definitely not right. Five is the rounding up from 4.5. Okay, let's move on. That was a lot of scrolling. Yeah, a lot of people got snagged on that. A lot of fours. Yeah, and that's one of those things, you're always taking the worst case scenario. There's actually ways that you could answer four and it'd be correct. Um, when you have that situation where there's 
a number for both men and women for a, some sort of like like laboratories or, or WCs, anything like that. Uh, if there's a reason, if there's enough information, uh, evidence to be able to say, you know, this is m very likely to be uh, more women than men, so we're going to not do it half and half, or more men than women, so we'll, we'll you know, divide it up in some other way, then that's a reasonable thing, and the code officials will likely accept that if you can kind of provide some evidence. So it's quite plausible that you might be able to say, well, no, we're going with nine, and we're going to say four and five. Uh, but if there's nothing really telling us that that's the case, uh, and the presumption would be that you would actually round up. So five, I think, is a better answer. Okay, number two. Uh, which of the following structures uh, spans, structures slash spans, uh, are the most likely? So let's run through them. Uh, concrete joist pan construction with 18 foot spans. B, structural steel wide flange framing plan with 35 foot spans. C, open web steel joist spanning 65 feet to masonry bearing walls. D, two by 12s at 16 inches on center with 24 foot spans. So this one, you may think is about something like, well, what, what tab am I going to go look at? Uh, it's not really about that. This one is actually sort of meant as a, a little bit of a uh, false uh, flyer, or whatever they call it, that, that uh, this is really just some of these make sense and some of them don't. So let's get rid of the ones that just clearly don't make any sense. So one of them is 2x12s at 16 for a 24-foot span. Uh, with an office type loading, there's really no way you could do a 24 foot span with a 2x12. 2x12s uh, might, uh, with a very good like Doug fur or something like that, you might be able to get to uh, about a uh, I don't know, 20 foot span, an 18 foot span, something like that. But you wouldn't be able to get to a 24 foot span. You could with eye joists and with a number of other wood products, but not with uh, not with something that simple. Plus, uh, it just uh, it's just not a sort of doesn't logically fit with the uh, commercial grade of the uh, project. So I'm going to X that one out. Uh, and then C, uh, open web steel joist spanning 65 feet to uh, masonry bearing walls. Now there's a bunch of reasons why I might choose to do that. I might say, I don't want to have any columns. I want to have this be wide open and flexible. Uh, but if you imagine an office building, a multi-story office building with 65 foot uh, open web steel joists, uh, those things are going to bounce like mad, right? That's just not believable unless there's some really strong reason why you'd want to have that clear span open space. Those are going to be very expensive. They're going to bounce a lot. Uh, it just doesn't fit to the office use in a sort of normal parlance. And there's nothing in any of the documentation that says, oh, and we need to have clear space, clear floor areas. So I'm going to get rid of C as well. So then the real question is just between A and B. And uh, A and B are both sort of plausible. Uh, one of the sort of interesting things here uh, that often happens with the NCARB uh, questions is you have more than one plausible answer. Uh, that, you know, uh, they actually have said uh, that they don't, they don't really see it that way. But uh, pretty much everybody agrees that they often have more than one plausible answer. It's just that one is a better answer than the other. Uh, and this would be an example of that. And uh, a joist pan system for concrete, that 18 foot uh, distance, the 18 foot span, it's just not for new construction. Joist pan is very robust. It has a lot of capacity. Uh, it's uh, a much higher capacity than just a regular flat slab or flat plate type uh, uh, concrete slab. Uh, and with a flat plate concrete slab in a uh, uh, office setting, I can easily go 20, 25, even 30 feet uh, with one of those. And the joist pans are even more robust than that. So an 18 foot span just doesn't feel right. It just, it's too short a span, it would be too expensive. And why would they want to have columns every eight, 18 feet? That just doesn't really uh, make any logical sense in, in this kind of a situation. So the sort of natural one, the one that's most likely in this scenario would be the wide flanges with a 35 foot span. Wide flanges, their sort of uh, sweet spot is going to be anywhere from about uh, 30 foot, so you know, even down to like 25 feet, something like that, 
up to about 40, possibly even up to a little higher than that. So if you think of it as 30 to, to 40 in that range, that's probably the sort of sweet spot for most wide flanges. So we're gonna go with B, uh, structural steel, wide flange framing with 35 foot spans. Moving on. Uh, as many of you know, there are not only multiple choice questions, but there's also fill in the blank questions. Um, our understanding is that whenever they have the fill in the blank, they're likely to be numbers, not words. Um, so I think that's logical for most of the time. It's going to be a, a number answer in this, uh, this setting. Uh, so this question, what hourly fire rating will be required for non-bearing partitions in the interior portion of the building. Uh, all right, well, um, we start thinking about that. There's gonna be somewhere in our building code, there's going to be uh, some information about like uh, exterior bearing walls would be, you know, say three hours, but uh, maybe two hours if it's far enough away from the property line and uh, interior columns might be one hour or two hour depending on which construction type it is. Uh, now we actually don't necessarily know which construction type it is. We've just in the question before we've made an assumption but we actually don't know that for sure. So that's kind of an interesting question here about how we would deal with this. So let's take a look at our question here. So this is the building code. I'm going to go all the way back up to the beginning just to show us again. the. All right. Um, so uh, if we're looking at this set of information, where would this information be? Would it be under use and occupancy? Probably not. Would it be under building heights and areas? Probably not. Would it be under types of construction? That seems plausible. So let's take a look at 66 and see what happens. So this is page 66. On the exam, it would probably be done by, not by page, but by uh, section number. Okay, so here we are, type of, uh, construction. Uh, and sure enough, right there, first thing we find, fire resistance rating requirements for building elements in hours. Uh, so we have bearing walls, uh, exterior and interior versions of bearing walls. Um, we have non-bearing walls and partitions at the exterior. Uh, the one that we actually got asked though was non-bearing walls and partitions in the interior. And I was worried like, well, we have type one, there's type two, there's type three. Uh, what are we going to do? We don't know which type it is. Look at that, they're all zero. So the answer, zero. <laughs> and you probably could have guessed that, uh, you know, an interior partition, uh, you know, there's, there isn't necessarily, if it don't have more information, uh, there isn't anything necessarily mandating that that be a fire rated uh, um, structure. If it was an interior partition that's a demising wall, suddenly that word demising means, has meaning, and it starts speaking to the idea that this is uh, maybe a, a wall that's separating out a fire rated area from uh, another area, like one apartment unit from another, or one uh, tenant use from another, or something like that. So that question could be very similar and give you a very different answer. All right, let's keep moving. Number four, in a fire emergency panic, how many rated stairwells are there required to be found in the floor plan to get people to safety? So you probably know this already. What do you think the answer is? Give you a second. The answer is going to be two, right? We need two ways of egress. If this was a bigger building, uh, we might need more. If this was a smaller building, like a tiny building, we might be able to get away with just one. But let's just confirm our, our thoughts about it. Uh, so in this case, I'm going to go back to the uh, building code. Now remember, I've sort of skipped ahead on a lot of these. I would, if we were coming at these totally blind, 
Uh, I would be looking at the program in certain situations. I'd be looking at the climate in other ones to gather enough information to then be able to go to the building code. In the interest of time, I'm just kind of going straight to the complicated one. Uh, so that's why I'm uh, using the building code so much on this. Uh, so, all right, let's go to the building code. Uh, and the question was uh, the minimum number of exits. So where is that going to be? That's going to be in the means of, ex of egress section. Because exiting, obviously, is part of the means of egress. And there we go right there. Under the means of egress, uh, we find minimum number of exits or access to exits per story. For occupant load of one to 500, remember we've already done an occupant load. We had 400 people, but even more importantly, we're talking about from an individual story of the building. So this is gonna be maybe 100 people per, uh, per floor. Uh, so we're definitely below uh, the 500 number, uh, and that's going to require us to have those two exits. Uh, if we were much, much bigger, we might have to have three, possibly even four exits. Uh, that's not the only d reason that we would choose the number of exits. It could also be we have uh, the same size building, but it's oriented in a much different way. It's much longer and thinner. And so therefore, our egress distance might not meet it. We might have to add a third uh, stairwell just because the, the length of uh, somebody going from one of the offices all the way to uh, an egress stair might have been stretched out so far that it goes beyond that actual uh, allowance, um, which in this case would be uh, 200 feet uh, if it was uh, a non-sprinkler building and 300 feet if it was a sprinkler building. So uh, like there's multiple ways we might attack this issue of how many stairwells there are, but the question didn't ask any of that about uh, any of that sort of extra complication. It just said, you know, it didn't, it didn't give us any of that. Plus, as we look at the uh, site plan um, or the, the site photo, this is a fairly compact site. There's really no way that we could have a building that was 400 feet long. Uh, so we couldn't really get into that kind of situation. Uh, so it doesn't really uh, uh, apply any. So you're losing the kind of information, kind of making a judgment call from the various sources of pieces of information you have. If you were tight on time, this is definitely one of those ones that I would have said, yeah, it's like, sounds like two to me, and I would have guessed on it without even bothering going through it all. But there you go. We just went through and found it, and we feel pretty comfortable with it. I think um, there's probably something here to, to sort of say out loud. So as you're scrolling um, uh, through all those pages, um, if, I have if I had never done a code review in my life, I would be like, how in the world does Mike yeah. know where to go? No, yeah, no, and absolutely. I think, I think the thing to say here is if, you know, if, if you're thinking about taking this exam, you know, a great way to prepare for this exam uh, is is to do a couple of code reviews, and so maybe you have a project, and maybe there, maybe you're working on a project, and you're just yeah. doing some modeling and drawing. Um, maybe you can go back and say, hey, you know, project architect or project manager, I want to do a code review on this, um, and then go do three or four code reviews in your office. Take projects that have already that already have a code review um, that's done, because the thing is, and I'm sure this is what Mike's going to say, is that. You go to the same places. Yeah. You need, you're collecting the same information time after time after time. They could probably distill the um, IBC down to like a, probably a three-page document, <laughs> right. and that's yeah. actually all the information. It's that probably you a little use. bit longer than that, but it maybe ten pages, yeah, something like that. That's the stuff you use every then, single time. And, and then, then there's an appendix with the other 500 pages for those special yeah. occasions when you need to go to something else. Yeah. No. Absolutely. In uh, in kind of the old days, uh, before everything was online. Uh, you know, you'd have a big, thick code book, and it would be, you know, the, the book might be six inches thick or five inches thick, something like that. And it would be, uh, have all, like, we'd have all kinds of post-it note uh, uh, little uh, places so we could find the pages that we always go to. 
you would always be going to the height and area limitations. You'd always be going to uh, the uh, classification of use type and what uh, the sort of issues are around each of those. You would always be going to, uh, you know, uh, the plumbing code is actually a great example. You know, you don't necessarily do that every time, but man, uh, it shows up a lot. You really got to take a look at that and make sure you got enough. Uh, uh, enough of uh, bathrooms and all of that. So there's there's probably a 10 or 12 different things that you look at over and over again. And then there's a bunch of other stuff that you look at occasionally. Yeah. Uh, and so once you start going through it, Mark's absolutely right, once you start going through it, you realize, oh wait, this isn't as complicated as it seems. Uh, and I highly recommend, I like the idea of actually doing a code review uh, of a project that already has a code review. So you can do it yourself and then check against the one that the other folks in your office did and sort of have that moment where you can see like, oh, does this, did, did I find the same pieces of information? And I mean, and then do another code review on a different project and you're gonna figure out like, oh yeah, gee, I just went to all these exact same, and then do another code review, do three or four of them. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and it'll be really clear like, oh yeah, yeah, I, got, I keep going to the same spots. Um, and NCARB is probably not, remember they're not uh, trying to, um, I'm not trying to trick evaluate, you. Evaluate, yeah. you know, whether you understand all the crazy screwball scenarios, but instead they want to, you know, they want to evaluate. You know, you you kind of can do a standard, reasonable, um, you know, uh, collect the proper information and make the proper decisions for a sort of a common scenario. They're not going to look for some crazy screwball thing to throw at you. I don't think. You know? Yeah, I, I mean, <laughs> the, you know, they might. Of course, you never know. But they the, they certainly don't think that. When we've yeah, talked yeah. with them, they. They certainly think that they're going to try to have this be as sort of rational and normal as possible. That's right. Uh, and sort of a classic example, one that we're not going to look at uh, today, but a classic example of that would be something like uh, the egress width uh, for a stairwell. And, you know, essentially, if I have a stairwell in a private residence, it's going to be a 36 inch width. But if I have a stairwell in a public setting, well, it's almost always going to be a 44 inch width unless I have a occupancy load that goes above a certain moment. And so often you'll be like, if you're kind of close to that occupancy load, you'll be like, wait, what was the number again? You go back, you look at how are they calculating that load, you do a quick calculation, and maybe your number comes in at, well, we can do it in 38 inches. Well, that's great, but then you realize, oh, but there's an exception somewhere that says the minimum number. So yeah, you went through the calculation, but the minimum number is gonna be 44 inches. Uh, and so you find that kind of thing over and over again. So these are numbers, these are tables, these are uh, concepts that will likely show up over and over again. So there's a good question from Johnny here. He's saying, is there a book or website if people don't work in a place where they do code reviews? Um, I don't know if there's a book or a website. Um, I guess we should make one. <laughs> <Right>. but, um, <laughs> there is actually, there's a pretty good Cheng book um, on how to use building codes. Mm. Uh, I would recommend it as like I love all Cheng books like every mm. architect does. Yeah. Um, and that one's a pretty good one. Uh, but the other thing is, you know, the IBC is right, right there uh, online. You could just look at a building, you know, maybe the building you're in and say, all right, how would I... Well, it, you know, does this building meet the code and just start looking stuff up and even that would give you a, a pretty fast uh, version of how to uh, find something. Yeah, I guess a thought I'm having is like, I get, I'm, Johnny, I'm sure you have a friend who works in another architect's office. Yeah. Um, that would be a good opportunity to kind of like buddy up and, and maybe go have a little study session at their office. Um, I know, I mean, I certainly know what you mean. Some, some firms don't uh, do that kind of work necessarily, but um, um, or if you're, you know, working for a contractor or something, it just may not be something that's in your normal purview. Or your local AIA chapter, I'm sure you can you can network yeah. your way into a into a code. I never said that before. You can <laughs> network your way into a code review. That's kind of crazy. Yeah, but that I sounds awful. True. But okay, uh, and you know, you should absolutely be using this as a, you know, people want to help you get through this process. You know, everybody is on your side on this, and so if you ask somebody. You say, look, uh, I don't have an opportunity to do code reviews, but I need to be able to do this for, for being able to pass this exam. You know, they'll spend a lunch with you and go through and help you bring the, you know, uh, bring the books or bring the, uh, their code reviews from other projects or something and, and give you a chance to sort of look through them. People really want to help you through these uh, exams. So use that, uh, that momentum to help you out. Okay, number five, where will a vapor barrier be located? So uh, if you remember when we were looking up here at climate, 
uh, climate told us that it was a temperate, which means it gets quite cold and it also gets quite warm. Uh, but uh, temperate is actually, in this context, grouped with cold uh, because of the nature of uh, the place that I'm worried about the vapor. Uh, I am mostly worried about when it's uh, cold outside uh, and uh, it's very warm and moist inside because people are breathing and uh, sweating and, uh, you know, making coffee and all those things that are producing moisture in the air. Um, and so I'm worried that that moisture, that high pressure moisture on the warm inside is going to become a dew point problem in my wall structure. So uh, in terms of uh, vapor barriers, uh, I am mostly trying to keep water out of my wall. So okay, let's go back to our answers. We have uh, four plausible answers here. A, just below the siding material. B, on the cold side of the insulation. C, just inside the interior finish material. And D, there is no vapor barrier in commercial buildings. Um, well, there certainly are vapor barriers in commercial buildings. It depends on the building type. You wouldn't necessarily call it a vapor barrier if you have a completely glass curtain wall type system. Uh, the curtain wall itself will act as a vapor barrier. Uh, so you wouldn't necessarily call it that in that context, but any other kind of scenario uh, of wall type construction, uh, any other assembly is likely to have uh, a, uh, a vapor barrier. So I'm not going to say, I, I am going to say that D is not it. Uh, and then these other ones, uh, just below the siding material. Well, just below the siding material would be uh, a logical answer if we were in a very warm climate. Because the uh, trick here is you're putting the vapor barrier on the warm side of the insulation. So in a very warm climate, the warm side of the insulation is actually towards the outside of the assembly. In a temperate or a cold climate, the warm side of the insulation is on the inside of the assembly. So uh, just below the siding material would be on the outside, so that's no good. Uh, and then B on the cold side of the insulation, that's actually just exactly backwards, uh, so that's no good. The answer is C, just inside the interior finish material. Now, what that, the real answer there is on the warm side of the insulation. It just happens to be that the warm side of the insulation is just inside the interior finish material. So there you go. Kind of interestingly, we used to call these, uh, they were called vapor barriers for a long time. And then uh, uh, like 30 years ago, 20 years ago, I, people sort of felt like the word barrier was kind of a lie because the vapor will always get through to some degree. Uh, and so they started being called vapor retarders, uh, and that was sort of considered a better way of thinking. But uh, then a few years back, uh, the, all the terminology switched back to vapor barriers, and so I don't really know what, what made that happen, uh, but uh, you'll still find a lot of people will refer to it as vapor retarders, not as vapor barriers, but I believe the exam now calls it again vapor barriers. And that concludes our session on Deep Thoughts with Deep Mike Thoughts, I know. Uh, there's, a, there's a little bit of history for you. Uh, okay, number six. Uh, which of the following are most likely to be included on the site plan, landscaping plan, and civil drawings? A, the encapsulation details of the oil tank. B, a parking lot for 90 cars. Uh, C, a line of deciduous trees for wind control. Uh, D, stormwater runoff systems. So there's a couple here that I can... Uh, just get off right off the bat. Uh, and one of them is C. Now, that sounds like a really good one, but it's actually backwards. So a deciduous tree, here's a deciduous tree, how's that for a beautiful tree, uh, is not going to be very useful for us from the uh, wind stopping standpoint. A coniferous tree, <laughs> It's going to be much better for that. It's going to have uh, the, if you will, leaves, its needles, uh, will be up all winter, which is when you're mostly worried about wind control. Uh, the deciduous tree is going to lose all its leaves in the winter, so it's not going to help exactly when you would want it. So uh, the, a line of deciduous trees for wind control just doesn't make any sense. If it said coniferous, then that's plausible. That might be something uh, that would be useful to know. Uh, equally, though, I probably wouldn't have the 
tree information. I might have some of it, but I probably wouldn't have a huge amount of tree information on the civil drawings. Uh, that would really be just the site plan and the landscaping plan. So let's take a look at a couple of these other ones. How about uh, parking for 90 cars? Well, uh, in the interest of time, I'm not going to go uh, through it uh, completely, but if we started going through our zoning code, uh, we would find there's some information in here about uh, the parking requirements. Um, and let's see, we maybe can find it quickly here. Uh, so here's our, our business uh, type. It's talking about the one that's near a pedestrian street. Uh, and it says, no spaces for the first 10,000 square feet, one space for every 1,000 square feet after that. Uh, that's not going to get us anywhere near 90 cars. So a uh, parking lot for 90 cars is just way, way, way too many uh, cars for our purpose. Uh, and what we've said already is that we're near a transit stop and they have a lot of focus if we go back to the program. Uh, they have a lot of information that they are very excited about in terms of uh, being uh, in encouraging transit options and a bunch of other sort of sustainability issues. So this is one of those examples where if you've kind of glanced through some of this other information, you would know that they're not going to be building a parking lot that's you know more than uh, double or even triple uh, the number of parking spaces that they would be required to have. They clearly have chosen this spot because it's near the transit hub, so they would be building the minimum number, and 90 is just way too many, uh, so that one is no good. So then it comes down to encapsulation details of the oil tank and stormwater runoff systems. Uh, encapsulation details of the oil tank is not a bad one. We mentioned under the uh, phase one that there's uh, an oil tank and that it's a problem. Uh, I would say two things. One, uh, that you're probably, if you have an oil tank in this kind of setting, you're probably not encapsulating it. You are probably removing it. So it seems much more likely that you would be removing this material and not encapsulating it. So that's one issue. The other issue is I'm probably not going to have encapsulation details of the oil tank on the landscaping plan. Now it's possible that it would be mentioned on the landscaping plan, but it just seems like not, it just doesn't fit to the uh, situation. The stormwater runoff system, however, that is gonna show up on all of these. You are gonna have information about the stormwater on the site plan, on the landscaping plan, and on the civil drawings. So that one clearly would be something that would have all of those drawings in, in play. And uh, we already talked about how they are trying to be very sustainable on this. They're going to be very focused on an issue like this. Uh, in fact, it even mentions the idea of uh, thinking about stormwater uh, if you look th closely through some of that information. So the answer, D, stormwater runoff systems. Okay, a couple more here. Seven, which of the following will likely be included in the fenestration system? Choose three that apply. So this is one of these other question types. They're currently being used, this uh, you know, um, check all that apply uh, idea of a question. Um, uh, 4.0 uses them, 5.0 will also use them. Presumably the case studies will have, have some of them uh, as well. Uh, so this is a question type you should get used to. Um, they're a little awkward and kind of strange because you have to sort of narrow it down and then you know, choose the ones that you know are, are sh for sure and then kind of uh, make a decision out of the ones that are a little bit of a closer call. Uh, so we're going to choose three of these possible six answers and we're thinking about which of the following will likely be included in the fenestration system. So fenestration is referring to the window system. That's what that term means. Um, I always think of it as uh, from the historical thing of the defenestration of Prague. That's how I remember the term. The defenestration of Prague was in the Middle Ages where the uh, mob stormed the uh, uh, city hall and threw the mayor of Prague in 1320, I think it was, out the window and uh, took over this. It was a coup. And so they refer to it as the defenestration of Prague. And you can't forget that word after hearing that story. And weirdly, it happened twice. There are two defenestration of Prague's. So, on to the question. I got 10 bucks that everyone who takes the exam and runs into <laughs> fenestration is going to remember. He's going to remember the story. defenestration of Prague. 
uh, it's a great, uh, interesting, fascinating uh, story, so read up on it. Um, okay, fenestration systems. Remember, this is a situation where the uh, program and the climate information have both talked about trying to find uh, as much, uh, trying to get as much um, sunlight and trying to have it be uh, very sustainable and all of that. So that when we talk about windows, we're going to be talking about the issue of getting uh, sunlight, blocking the solar gain when we can, uh, but getting a lot of natural light in. So that's what we're going to be really uh, focused on here. So A, low E coating, <clears throat> excuse me, low E coating on surface one of double glazed windows on the south side. So on the south side sounds good. Surface one sounds problematic to me. So I, I'm, I'm going to come back and think about that one in a minute, and I'll talk about why in just a second. B, reflective sills and horizontal mullions to reflect light deep into the office space. Well, we just talked about how if you read the program and you read the climate information, there's a number of places it talks about gaining as much of the natural daylight as it can. That sounds like a great answer. So I'm going to tentatively say B is one of the possible answers here. C, low E coating on surface two of double glazed windows on the southeast side. So let's think about this surface issue. So if I have a double glazed window, means I have one piece of glass, another piece of glass, I have a little spacer, piece that holds it all together. Uh, there's probably some argon gas and some other things uh, uh, in the space in between. Uh, so I have these uh, four surfaces and on the outside I have one surface right here, that would be surface one. Surface two would be right there, so that's two. I have a one, two, three, and four. So this first one, A, talked about the low E coating being on surface one. Well, it's possible that you might do that. Uh, it would work. It would actually be more effective than it being on surface two. But the trouble is the low E coating is such a soft material. It's essentially a thin plastic coat that has really microscopic levels of metal sort of embedded in it. And that's how the low E works. It's using those little bits of metal uh, to emiss the heat away uh, from, from the surface. If I put that on surface one, it means every time anybody touches that window or tries to clean the window, they're going to scratch the coat. And it's going to look horrible in just, you know, after any uh, any time anybody cleaned the window, it would look terrible. So you would really never put, even though it's actually better from a low E coating standpoint, you would never put it on surface one. So, all right, I'm going to go back and I'm going to X out A. But then C said surface two on the southeast side. Well, that sounds great. So there I have, uh, it's protected, it's in the middle space. There's really nothing you could do to damage it. Uh, that's going to be great. That's totally going to work. So I'm digging the low E coating. We're going we're gonna to stop uh, a big chunk of the solar gain coming into this building because of that. And then, oh, now we have another one. D, low E coating on just some, some surface of the double glazed window. So it could be one, two, three, or four uh, for the north side of the building. But wait a minute, we're at uh, latitude 40, the north side of the building. There's just not going to be any direct sunlight happening on that north side of the building. That low E coating really isn't going to do anything for us. It's not going to hurt us, it just means we're going to be spending money on it and it's not going to help. So that one's maybe, I mean, maybe we'd put it on there, it'd probably have a little bit of help, but it's not going to have much of a help. So then we have E, window system with a high U value. Well, that sounds good until you realize, oh wait, no, it's the R value that I want high. The R and the U are reverses of each, inverses of each other. So actually I would want a window system with a low U value because the R is one over U and the U is one over R. So if I'm looking to have a, a very good uh, resistance uh, from the heat flow, i.e. a high R for resistance, uh, that's going to mean uh, I'm really looking for, in the windows, a very low U value. So that one's backwards, so that one's no good. And then 
last one here, laminated glass at all skylight locations. Does that seem reasonable? Because we're trying to decide between D and F. D, as we said, well, it's the north side. It's not really getting us anything. Uh, but uh, F, uh, is that getting us something? Well, absolutely. Laminated glass at uh, the skylight locations. Uh, I would always choose to have uh, laminated glass. There's a couple of other types of glass I could choose. Uh, but essentially, if I'm going to have a skylight, I will always choose something like laminated glass. Uh, and the reason for that is, if you imagine a skylight uh, with like just annealed glass, something like regular kind of glass, and let's say there's a work person up on the roof and uh, they accidentally drop their hammer into uh, the glass in the skylight, and it's just regular glass. That hammer is going to go right through it, and it's going to break that glass into giant shards. And those giant shards are going to come raining down through uh, into the building and uh, flying into this atrium space that we talk about in the program. Uh, so you'd have big, giant sheets of glass with very sharp corners uh, flying down into the space. So one of the things you could do is you could use tempered glass. And tempered glass is what they do in things like uh, uh, windshields and things like that. Uh, you also do it in uh, glass in doors and places that, that might get shattered. And the tempered glass is where they take it and they put, uh, they make the glass and then they put a lot of uh, heat and then cool it and do various other things. So they're putting a lot of stress into the glass. And so it makes it very strong, but then it also means that when you break it, man, that thing's going to break all over the place. It's just going to shatter into a million tiny little pieces. And if you think about it, you'd much rather have that happen than having a three-foot-long dagger of glass come flying down from the skylight. So uh, tempered glass might be a way that I would choose to do it. But even better than that would be tempered glass that has multiple laminations so that I have uh, a layer of glass that might be tempered, might be something else, uh, and then I have another layer of glass, and then I have another layer of glass. And in between each of these, I have layers of adhesive plastics. And those are specifically meant that when this thing breaks, somehow somebody breaks this thing, the adhesives, those plastic sheets, will hold it all together. So even though the glass is completely broken and it will have to be completely replaced, uh, you're not going to get that shower down of those giant sheets of uh, broken glass. They're going to just be uh, uh, sort of held in place through these uh, plastic laminations in this system. So all skylights are always going to have laminated glass. Like I said, there's a couple of other ways. You can, you can talk about it slightly differently in some other situations, but essentially that's always going to be the case. So that's a better answer than D. So I'm going with B, C, and F. So in totally crazy news, while you were doing that, Mike, we tweeted um, the question, which included the word fenestration, and we got a reply from at fenestration bot, <laughs> which said, <laughs> at Black Spectacles, music to my fenestration only ears. I'm not joking. <laughs> it, it literally just happened. There's, there's a fenestration bot. Yeah, so check yeah. it out. I have no idea what it is. You gotta love that. All right, last question. Uh, number eight, standpipes access will be where? So standpipe access will be where? So for this one, let's take a look at uh, our neighborhood image. So, all right, uh, first thing we have to remember is what is a standpipe, right? And a standpipe, there's a couple of different ways that a standpipe can be uh, considered. The, the word can mean a couple of different things. Uh, but in general, in a context like this, when you say standpipe, you're probably talking about something that's part of the fire protection system. So imagine you're a firefighter and you're coming to the building uh, in a presumed emergency. Uh, people are streaming down the stairs to get out of the building. You're running into the lobby and getting ready to go up into the building. You figure out where you need to go using the enunciator panel or whatever information uh, the security system has. Uh, you are about to run up to say the third or fourth, let's say the third floor, uh, and you could take a fire hose, plug it into a uh, fire hydrant in the street, let that hose fill up, and then run with the hose up the stairs to the third floor, or fifth floor, or seventh floor, or whatever it is. 
But that would be kind of ridiculous, right? First of all, it would be unbelievably heavy. Uh, but second of all, you're going to be getting water all over the place and water is going to be slippery and people are trying to get out in a panic and all of that. Uh, and you also have this big, thick hose that's now up in the stairwell and people are tripping over it when they're trying to get out. You're actually going to cause more damage and more injury than you're going to be helping. So what can you do? Well, use a standpipe. So the standpipe is going to be a pipe that's going to go vertically through the building and it's going to reach out to the sidewalk and it's going to be a spot where I can connect to it. So a firefighter can run up to the building, connect to a hydrant and to the standpipe, <clears throat> excuse me, so that they are charging with the pressure from the hydrant. They are charging that standpipe, filling it with water. And then the firefighters can run up the stairs with an empty fire hose. Uh, and then uh, at the floor that they think the fire is, they can come out of the stairs and tie into the standpipe at that point. So now uh, they have a full connection of a fire hose coming all the way from the hydrant to the standpipe, up the standpipe to the fire hose again, and they can fight the fire on that floor. So the standpipe is sort of becomes a part of the fire hose, if you will. Uh, it's an incredibly useful tool. Uh, the standpipe would normally be near the stair, sometimes in the stair, because you don't want the firefighters trying to figure out where the hell it is, right? They want to they wanna know exactly when they get to that floor, they come out, it should be right there for them. Uh, so it has to be easy for them to use and find. Uh, and that's sort of a sort of typical idea of how a standpipe works. It could also be that you have a standpipe that's tied into the sprinkler system. Maybe it's just there to provide more pressure. So it would be the same basic idea it would tie in from a uh, pumper truck or from a hydrant. Uh, you would uh, you know, shoot water into that standpipe. But then instead of it being for direct firefighting with a fire hose, it would be uh, adding extra pressure or even any water. Sometimes you have dry systems and it might fill the whole system in uh, so that the sprinkler system could then start to work. So th there's a couple of other ways you might use the term, but they're all basic versions of something like that where you are uh, taking pressure from the uh, fire hydrants or pumper trucks or the, something along those lines from the fire department uh, and you are pressurizing in order to fight a fire uh, into the building in some sort of useful, simple way. So, okay, uh, let's take a look at some of our answers and we'll come back to our site plan. So the answers are the east side of the site, um, typical cleanouts uh, will be at uh, each uh, direction change. Yeah, that's not, doesn't have anything to do with uh, standpipes. Uh, facing the sidewalk, well, that's possible. So we, so far we have east side of the site and facing the sidewalk. And then D, rooftop connection to the RTU, the rooftop unit for mechanical. Yep, that's not what a standpipe is doing. Uh, so it's either A or C, east side of the site, or C, facing the sidewalk. So let's take a quick look again. East side of the site is going to be right there along an alley just a few feet away from uh, a bunch of residential buildings, there's really no way that that would be the spot that you would connect. You're not anywhere near where the hydrants are. It'd be very difficult for the uh, fire trucks to sort of pull into that very small alley. It's guaranteed that it's going to be somewhere near uh, the front of the building on the main sidewalks. So it could be on the north side. It could be on this north uh, uh, northwest side. It could be on this southwest side. Uh, it potentially could be over here, but only if you knew exactly what was going to be built uh, next door. So the answer to this one can't be uh, to the east side because it just doesn't make any sense. It's absolutely going to be facing to the sidewalk. Uh, because the firefighters need to be able to have quick and easy access to this. Uh, sometimes with the standpipe, the connections, you'll see that they, have, uh, they break into two or even four or five different heads, and that allows people, allows the firefighters to connect to a hydrant, but then also they need more pressure. They can connect to a pumper truck. They can get multiple things going. You'll also see, it literally have a little sign on it that says, this is for direct firefighting, or this is for a sprinkler system, or for whatever it actually is for. So... Answer to the eight, C, facing the sidewalk. All right. <clears throat>
Well, unfortunately, uh, it doesn't look like anybody got them all right. <laughs> <laughs> it was a tough one. And so, uh, some of these, you know, uh, we're just kind of taking our hand, testing out these different ideas. Uh, you know, they're not, these are not necessarily going to be uh, exactly like the questions are on, uh, uh, on the exam. So don't, don't fret about it. Uh, we're really using this just as a way, a tool uh, to talk about the way that these things uh, work, not so much the specifics of that. So don't worry about it if you didn't get them all. It's still good. Cool. All right. Um, so thank you, Mike. Uh, thanks to all of you who have tuned in and uh, submitted their questions today. As I mentioned earlier, uh, our next ARE Live uh, session is going to be a special one. It'll be live and in person here at Black Spectacles offices at our 1871 uh, spot here in the Merchandise Mart. We'll be collaborating with Mike and our friends at AI Chicago's Young Architects Forum, featuring three young architects who are taking different approaches to ARE 5, ARE 4, and somewhere in between. We'll be having free drinks, food, some giveaways. If you want to save your seat, register for free at bksp.es slash ARE live dash RSVP. As I said, um, seats are limited, so um, it'll be on a first come, uh, first serve basis. And for those of you who uh, uh, aren't going to be hopping on a plane to come join us uh, in person, we'll be broadcasting live as usual, so you can register at blackspectacles.com slash podcast. Um, to learn more about our ARE uh, exam prep curriculum, go to blackspectacles.com um, where uh, you can try out any of the free course videos. And for those of you who are ready to start preparing for the ARE, and if you're already an AIA member, you can use coupon code 92816 PDDYT, that's P as in Paul, D as in dog, D as in dog, YT, um, to get a 15% discount for the entire duration of your ARE exam prep membership. Finally, please leave a comment below the video to let us know what you think. Share any suggestions you may have. I promise we'll read every word that you write and use them to tune our next episodes. So thanks for watching.